Hi. Okay. Got it. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Strada, for inviting me to visit your panel this afternoon. I'm really honored to be here, you know, to talk about a topic that is so passionate for me and that I am, want to share with you some of my concepts and principles of what I think public health is also based on science, uh, as well as our uh, the academic part of it. Uh, public health probably is one of our most important aspects of our lives. Contrary to what people may believe, it dictates how we live, who we live with, how we are gonna live, and how long we are gonna live. Public health is all around us. It is in the air. While we're here now talking, it's in the air we breathe. It's also what we're breathing in, all the pollutants, the allergens, the viruses, the bacteria, the fungus is in our water, everyday water that we drink. We're dealing with the pathogens and the algae. Public is also the, the food we buy, how we buy it, where we buy it. Is it, is it preserved and stored correctly? How do we cook it? Are we cooking it at the right temperature? Do we have family that we're feeding it to? Is it fresh? Is it not soil and what we eat? And also people more importantly think of public health as a structure. It is the public health department. I am going to the public health center. Oh, I'm going around to the public health neighborhood setting. Public health is the people. We the people make up what public health is, what it's going to be and what it should be. It is everything is the people and the people we're living. I've been involved with public health probably over longer than most of you all are old. I was, um, when I was a student at the University of Illinois, way back in the 60s, or, I was assigned to a little neighborhood health center. My, my duties were to visit mothers who had high risk babies that were born at the county hospital. Part of that responsibility with me and my team were to go to these homes to visit these mothers to see if she if they were okay and if the baby was improving properly. Interestingly enough, it was very difficult to catch the mothers in, at home because many of them were not at the addresses that were left that they gave when they left the hospital. And another thing was interesting about the community is that those of you from Chicago know over in the Cook County area, the west side had the largest infant mortality rate in the city and also partly through the country. One of the things that was a phenomenon was that the area that had the highest infant death was surrounded by three of our largest prestigious institutions. You had the University of Illinois that was two blocks south of the area. It was set right off of Harrison near Cook County Hospital. And then across the street was the Presbyterian St. Luke. Loops. Yet the members in that community had the highest infant date, death and maternal death rate. As a result of that, I became involved in doing research and trying to understand why the reason behind that. As a result, it was clear that there was a direct relationship between the, the uh, residents of that community and their perception and the care that they received from the University of Illinois in Presbyter uh, Presbyterian St. Luke's. Also keep in mind at the time, Cook County was the major hospital where most mother who are in need of care had to go to receive care. A lot of private services were not given at Rush or Presbyterian as it was then in those days. So, uh, so uh, ultimately as we go on, people say, well, so what does that mean? So what? What is public health? Well. Public health is really a science. It's, it's a science and an art. Just as I indicated and described the experience from living in, from working over in the uh, West Side community, the people in that community were fed up with the number of infant deaths that they had. As a result of that, members and leaders coordinated themselves and organized a community group. And that community group met with representatives from the University of Illinois, from the Presbyterian St. Luke's as well as county, and we're given the uh, the um, the authority to set up a neighborhood health center, and they will provide all the resources they need to assist the people in the community. 
as a result of that, that community, that neighborhood health center became uh, the uh, vision house, this, the vision house, which, which based the Valley Outpost, I'm sorry, the Valley Outpost Neighborhood Center, which really, we believe, was the precursor of what we know now as Miles Square. As a result of that science, from that science, from that art, from the people getting together, can you see the end of that? Uh, the art of preventing disease, uh, public health is prolonging life and improving the quality of life. And that's what the members of the Delhi Outpost West Side did. They organized efforts and they informed the choices of the people within that community did have a place to go that was safe for them. It was an organization. It was a it was public because it was a community and it was private because the organiz the institution from the University of Illinois and over press, although they're a public institution, they provided the resources that were needed in that community and also saved the lives of many individuals. So when you think of public health, what is public health? The public health, public health is the public, and it can be as small as a handful of people, as we started out over in the Valley Outpost, or it can be as large as a village or our entire city here in Chicago. And uh, here, what are the characteristics that we're looking for? Public health is very complex. It's a multi-dimensional, multi-facet uh, area of study is made of many elements and different uh, individuals going to different levels of, of experience or, or specialty. Many people are involved with the, with the health, the environment. You have the environmental health component. We have the community health component, which I'm mostly involved with. Behavioral and mental health component, talking about your, uh, your uh, what, TNT, your treatment, not trauma. Some people are interested in the health economics, and a lot of, especially those that are involved with the federal, state, local uh, government want to know how much is this going to cost. Some people want to be involved with the public policy, which dictate how services are going to be provided. Many of us are in the health education. Health education is integrated with mostly all of these components. The health politics, of course, we know Chicago, people get confused between public health and, and that uh, Chicago public health should be for the people and not at the desire of our politicians. Uh, we have the occupational health, the disability, gender, and now sexual and reproductive health inequality. One of the public health, common, people think of public health, when you think of our, our encouraging people, make sure you wash your hands dietary precaution. We often think of public health as vaccinations, getting your immunizations. In fact, I don't know how they're doing it now, but I remember when, and it may be, you can help me with this, Dr. Strata. Right now we're back in school. Kids, I didn't, I haven't heard anything about children going back to school who have been, who have been checked for the, for the immunizations up to date, uh, the current vaccination status for them, their parents, their grandparents, now, unless it's out there and I'm just blind to it, I haven't heard or seen it in the newspaper. Right now, we call, we, there's a high incidence of suicide among our young and, and our teens and the focus on suicide prevention. This whole smoking sensation has just gone out, has just gotten alarming. Obesity within our young people must be addressed. Uh, we have a, and another major problem that, we, that I need to uh, refer to when we talked about the Valley Outpost neighborhood, we recognized that there was a high need of care and they could not understand, well, listen, you have, you have um, county right here. Well, yeah, we had county because that's where the patient was going. But the questions were, why can't they go over to the University of Illinois? Why can't they go over to Press Luke, St. Luke? It certainly wasn't a question of accessibility because they were all in the geographic area. So it had to be something else. So there were co a correlation, as I indicated, between the, the availability and their perception of being uh, respect, uh, receptive of their need. And also the teaching of condom, as well as for the, for the protection and control of your STD. All of this is public health. Then we go further, public health is a broad field, as I indicated. 
the focus, the focus, the focus. Remember, the focus is on the pro protection, promotion, and the prevention of illness and diseases. It's best known for our infectious disease, I indicated. I've also talked about the environment and climate change is upcoming. We also believe, when, I, when I'm referring to we, I'm talking about the literature and the science, recognize that racism is a public health problem. We know housing, there's a direct relationship between public health and how people live. We know their relationship between alcohol and substance abuse obesity, violence is definitely a public health issue. Problem, the violence in guns must be addressed, eradicated and reversed. I know uh, when most people, younger people, when you talk about public health, uh, we seem to believe that it only emerged when COVID-19 pandemic hit. Pan, uh, public health, as you know, have been involved since centuries, way back from isolation and quarantine in the early days. So even with the emergence of COVID-19 pandemic, it really made Ameri Americans in our, in our community to become more conscious, to reflect back on why we have a public health and a public health department. Oh, yes, this is another good one people oh, ask me that. Real quick, because a lot of us maybe don't know acronyms or abbreviations. What is ETOH? Um, Chicago Department of Health. Thank you. So In fact, know, right, no, 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 no. right? It says ETOH on one year, ETOH and something. Oh, ETOH, uh, that's uh, 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 alcohol. Which one was that up here? No, what was it? Oh, right here. Right there, uh, alcohol, I'm sorry. That, thank you. Uh, that That's the... Uh, Alcoholism and substance abuse is a public health problem. I got Prior it. to the World War II, after World War II, it was it was known almost as a crime for folks to be abused to abuse alcohol. Many times they were in, in in jail because it's on the street of alcoholism. Now we know it is a public health problem. Uh, we know substance abuse, the level of substance abuse. For young people, when they first introduced it, or anyone really, the the uh, theory on substance abuse is that when you're first introduced to it, it's almost like a sociological pleasure. You're among your friends, you try it for an experiment, you have enjoy it, and folks seem to like you and have you around. So, ooh, I felt pretty good. So then, that's part of a sociological perception, or uh description however then you want to have it again then psychologically you believe that oh sociologically i felt so good using that substance that perhaps i need to have it again and i need more that's when substance abuse now become a psychological need among individuals who first tried it out as an interaction uh, association now your mind is saying i need it in order to be able to interact and socialize so now you tried it now for several weeks in a month so now you say i want to quit however the physiology of the substance have now entered the system the blood system whereby now you're making chemical changes within the structure of the body therefore for individual who wants to stop using the drug or substance it becomes more difficult because now it is no longer just a sociological interaction or a psychological interaction, but now as it became a physiological addiction. And that's why I make it more difficult for people to say, I'm going to quit today and tomorrow. You cannot arbitrarily and independently quit now because you need some assistance and getting the drug eradicated from the body to cleanse the body to get back to a normal physiological state. Obesity, we know under studies that have been conducted, this go back 10, 15, 20 years ago. If you think about it, obesity is not new. It started, I remember when I was at the Cook County Hospital, we used to have young people that were admitted who were pregnant who were already overweight. Now remember that was 10, 15 years ago. There were studies that were conducted. Of course, we know there's relationship between obesity and fast food. You may have read studies that indicated that our country is so fed away. We're so up on greed that we will fill the 
feed the animals anything in order to have a large stock so that we can slaughter, sell the meat to, and the stock has already been infested with a lot of substance that cause those who eat the food now to gain weight and become larger. Then another thing, you know, there's been a movement on, on, on acceptance and people feeling good about themselves where before individuals, especially young people, were concerned about their weight, their, their lifestyle, whereas now it's open that they, there's the, they don't feel the pressure to control appetite or, I mean, or perhaps that obesity is acceptance. Now, the problem with that is the fact that we need to teach our young people, those who are others who are obese, is not the physical appearance that one is concerned with. We're concerned about the health problems that's related, directly related to obesity. And we know that it's what cardiovascular, it has to relate to diabetes, it has, has to relate to circulatory problems. So that's part of the public health. So if we look at violence, let me just say, and I must say from my, uh oh, let me go back from my, did I miss it? Where I was on my, uh, violence. Let me share and emphasize with you so that you will share and tell everyone, violence is a learned behavior. I was director of OB uh, Guyane at Cook County Hospital over five, six years. We saw mothers and babies, mothers coming in delivering babies 100. We could have anywhere from 30, 40 new babies delivery a day. Just as I indicated early, because mothers, basically, that was their primary source of care. Those mothers that had those brand new babies, I would make rounds every day, talk to many of them. And of course, the ages were getting younger and younger. Some of those mothers that were delivering at the ages of 15, 16, and 17 years old, and they made rounds to, to visit them. Many of them, especially those that was 15, looked at their new baby as though it was a toy. They thought, oh, look at my baby. Isn't she cute? Isn't she pretty? I never, ever, irrespective of the age, I never, ever heard a mother say, oh, look at my baby. I want him to grow up to be a, a officer. I want him to grow up to be a teacher. I want him to grow up to be a fireman. I want him to grow up to be a good, productive citizen in the community. Or the little girl, oh, look at my baby girl. She is so darling. I want her to grow up to be very, I want her to grow up to be a lady. No, I want her to grow up, I want her to be a nurse. I want her to be a teacher all these very positive things about these new babies. Over all of my years of experience working with over thousands of mothers and babies, I never heard a mother say, oh, I want my son to grow up to be violent. I want my son to grow up to be the biggest gangster on the, on the corner. I want my son to grow up to be the number one dropout. I want my daughter to be the first on the street. Never. So where did all this violence come from nowadays? is learned behavior. It needs to be addressed at the very beginning. Our public health efforts need to focus on putting the money up front, focus on prevention, rather than always putting the money up. We have one of the largest incar incarceration population. We have probably one of the best uh, uh, economic development in our jails. We have probably one of the biggest in, uh, uh, structure for those individuals to work in those groups. And then our, and our young men and women are the product or the substance of those systems. That's public health. Now, when I indicate when COVID-19, even though the urgency as we thought of it then has subsided, you better believe the virus is not gone. It will never leave. It is now in our society. Remember, a virus is a live organism. It wants to live. It wants to survive. So it will mutate, just like we think of TB, tuberculosis. Those, are, those of you who are old enough will remember we had tuberculosis center. Tuberculosis, uh, we still have a patient diagnosed with TB. Polio, you thought polio was gone and eradicated. The virus is still there. We've identified individuals who have, who have, who have died, who were 
tested positive for the polio uh, vac uh, virus. So these are uh, pointers that, you know, I get so involved with public health, I can go on and on. But just trying to capture the absence, the essence of how broad public health is and how important it is in our lives. Okay, why, <laughs> why is it important? It's important because we're trying to do what? Prevent hazards. We're trying to track disease and outbreaks. That's why early in the in the COVID nine in the COVID back, uh, pandemic, one of the uh, focus of the ordinance that was introduced was so that people within our so that the department or the the, the government or the mayor or the commissioner would introduce a program called Boost in the Hood, whereby individuals within the community will be best recruited and trained so that they could go to the residents in their home to treat first. You have to early recognize the, the problems there. Once you recognize, you have to screen for it, you have to test for it, then you treat it and refer it. And that's now when we go into the vaccination in order to what? avoid, of course, disease. The other thing is important because why? We have to set safety standards to protect our workers and climate change. For example, you may go in and out of a, of a, a um, eating facility. I don't know if you ever noticed, you remember we used to have, we used to have uh, uh, requirements that the, the worker, the cook, you had to wear a hairnet, you remember they supposed to have gloves if they're handling food directly. They were supposed, if you're handling food, part of the safety standard was that you're not supposed to handle food and handle money. If we look at some of our, we have standards in place to help, to help protect the community. The problem is they're not in compliance and the individuals are not maintaining compliance. The school nutrition program, that we, we're pretty good, uh-oh. And trying to make sure our children are um, getting there. And I lost my. Uh... You're just a, like three back. Hey, sis, and, and not to cut you off too soon, but uh, we did promise we were going to do a shortish presentation. I don't know if you can wrap it up in the next five minutes or so, so we can. Oh, end yeah. the question. I can. This you need to know. What is the difference between the medical model and the public health not? We need to be aware of this. So as we search for a new commissioner, we want to make sure that they're clear on the difference between a medical doctor focused on the treatment of individuals, whereas a public health administrator or an executive knows that public health focuses on the people within the community. And then now here I'm just going to show you, give me an idea what our, what our structure should look like. This is our old, I mean, what's the current? Uh, organizational structure that we have now in place for the Department of Health, for Chicago Department of Health. So if you look at the way this structure is made, then if we look at the name of the, in the in, as I just went through, the different areas of public health issues and problems, you will notice on here, very little of these, they have behavioral health. We don't have anything about environmental, epidemiology, health education, health educators, public health nursing. So when we look at a Department of Health, you're supposed to encompass the, 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 the components of what public health is. I will make it, summarize it by saying thank you. And hopefully you'll invite me back again. Of course, you're all, this is, girl, this is your home. What you talking about? We started this together. We're going to keep on. So actually, Howard is kicking us off, which is brilliant. Um, I'm just going to get you to stop sharing love. And then um, I can... Uh, I can actually host. Can you can you stop her from sharing so we can see each other's faces? So, um, we didn't we didn't do introductions. Please feel free to introduce yourselves because we have about an hour for discussion. This is also the first time that we're kicking off this kind of discussion. I think it's important that we're not just strategize at these meetings, but we go into a deep dive on these topics that we care so much about. And we've identified public health, uh, um, and uh, the environment as the first two topics that are coming up. So Howard asked a brilliant question. It says, it would be great to hear from everyone and to hear what each person thinks public health is. Uh, we're, and he says, we're all experts. And I, I agree, as a mother, I, I am telling you, man, during the pandemic, I became a warrior. And I think a lot of us mm -hmm. did too, for very obvious reasons. But 
Um, uh, Barbara, can you can you stop sharing or uh, Rand? Can you get the the share to stop if possible? Oh wait, maybe I have the options. Hold up. Oh, stop participant sharing. Dude. Okay, so we're gonna and then uh just to heads up, we are recording. If you want to change your icon or your name, uh, because we we hope to use some of these really good educational bits, not just to support the Johnson campaign, but to educate people on this important topic and others. So who wants to kick us off? Who wants? What do you think public health is? Or what, what is it to you ideally, maybe? What should we have, right? And welcome, Veda. I see you. Welcome, Bridget. Welcome, Michelle. Lou, come on now. Don't be shy. Let's go. I'll start off since I'm at a light right now. <laughs> bless you. My bless name, you. Oh, sure. Um, my name is Bridget White. Um, I was attending um, at one point the People Response Network meetings. I'm a mom of two current CPS students. I work with the Parent Mentor Program, and I'm also a community health worker. And uh, with public health, a, a lot of it, I wasn't really familiar until attending um, the meetings with People Response Network. I, you know, to be honest, it, it really um, didn't resonate and I didn't pay attention to it. But of course, with COVID, you know, that made us more aware of things. Uh, and that's even how I became a community health worker because um, they're showing the disparities of things that I was learning about via Zoom. And then I was like, wow, you know, I want to be a part of helping change this because um, we do have so many disparities in our communities. We don't have easy access to uh, resources pertaining to our health. So to me, public health is just having easy access. Um, one thing that was always stressed in the meetings, uh, which I never knew until Dr. Howard said so, and maybe a couple others of how we used to have that in our schools back in the day. And they took it out of our schools because mm -hmm. a lot of times parents can't get, um, don't have transportation. So why not make it easily accessible to those um, to have it at the schools? That way the immunizations that I guess used to happen back in the day, the parents could just go right there if they don't have a clinic in their neighborhood. So to me, that's what public health is. It's just making it easily accessible for people and making it affordable so that we can improve our health. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Bridget. Good to you hear know you. You know what? That's that's bloody brilliant. Uh, I think for for my frustration during the pandemic is that I know they had the vaccines, they had the money, and they still didn't distribute properly. And it was a fight. It was a fight to get them to to even just fuck. Sorry, 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 sorry. I can do this, Barbara. Basic, I know. Basic PPE, masks. You would right. not believe the fight I had because I used to be the former steward. I, I was a steward for almost 20 years at Harold Washington District. So I was at the bargaining table. And at one point I had to tell the attorneys, do you want our people to die? Because that's what you're going to do. And they mm -hmm. couldn't answer that, you know, because they, they were they were making some very poor choices. But to me, public health meets the needs of people. Public health doesn't send kids to school before they're vaccinated. Come on now, you know. And so that to me was one of the most vile criminal things that the TPS could have done is to call our kids back when there were no effing vaccinations for a young. That was criminal. I don't care what anybody right. says. Sorry, that's my rant. No, you're right. I don't mean to kick us off, but that still hurts. <laughs> uh, somebody else want to go, Howard, or somebody else, uh, Howard's an expert too. Uh, Bar Barbara, I didn't do you justice. You were the former commissioner of the, what was your former title under Harold Washington? I was his chief deputy commissioner of the Department of Health. My area encompassed uh, probably all of the um, practitioners, public health nurses, outreach nurses, the epidemiologists, the the uh, screening. Uh, we had HIV, AIDS, STDs, all of the, the component. We had the neighborhood health center, mental health center, infant mortality, maternal child health. Um, his, his look at the organizational chart that I just showed you, and I'll, I'll present a comparison of what his vision was and his philosophy was. He believed that public health refers to the people and that public health was for the people doctor. So we had components in practically every component. We, had, we even had doctors in the school, children with first time, many of them ever had an ear test, an eye test. They had children been labeled as slow learners. 
only to find out that once they were screened for hearing and testing, found out that many of them could not see or hear. So we had to re, you know, they had to re uh, uh, assign these individual students and uh, children into the appropriate classroom. I could go on and on. It was an excellent experience. We had like a $300, $330 million budget just alone that I had to just work with to help get the uh, word out to the people. We did the screening, as I indicated, vaccination. And, I, and Howard and I worked together very closely. In fact, Howard or Dr. Ehrman was probably then, I must say, just a, as he is now, very active, very strongly supportive, and was one thing such a leader in public health as well as he is today. And it's so good seeing him, working with him, and it's just an honor with you two, uh, uh, host, uh, Estrada, I see some other names down here, Bridget, Lynette, and all of you guys. And I, I uh, just want to thank you. Hey, it's a together thing, right? Because we're not going to get our basic needs met if we don't unite. That's just how it is. And Howard also is, uh, Howard, you can speak up, brother. Uh, but I did want to elevate Lynette. Lynette, can you maybe talk about, you posted something in the chat that you were on a show last night. Um, oh, a heat wave in the Black community. Speak to that, sister, because look, to me, these issues are all interconnected and we all, you know, understand the role that capitalism plays in all this BS. You talked about profiteering and greed, spot on. But to me, the environmental issues are directly tied to racism, are directly tied to public health. And one thing I loved about your presentation is that you elevated and interconnected a lot of issues like police violence, like the need to have sex ed, which I'm a hate, I hate to say, CPS doesn't do 100% of a good job on that either. You know what I'm saying? But Lynette, why don't you speak to the show and then I'm going to call on Howard next if that's all right. Lynette, go ahead, sister. Yeah, hey, hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel, for um, creating this communal space um, and um, allowing um, us to hear Dr. Norman's um, expertise. Um, so I, I went on Chicago uh, Tonight Black Voices. Uh, and the segment was about um, the heat wave that we just experienced and how the Black community um, it's, you know, it's dealing with that heat wave, coping with the heat wave and how um, how much has changed or hasn't changed since the 1995 heat wave. Um, so in, in the segment, um, the journalist Brandis, she asked me about um, the elderly and um, <laughs> isolation was a big uh, social determinant uh, for why so many um, elders died in the 1995 heat wave and I informed um, Brandis and the audience that elders are more isolated now than in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, we right. have a smaller we have a smaller black population. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased isolation among communities. If you you know think about we went from um, being able to do in-person sessions to now doing everything virtual. And even though um, people are now doing more um, in-person events, it's still risky. If we look at all the COVID-19 hospitalizations that's going on right now, um, I wish the segment about heat would have been longer because we only had eight minutes in total and it was two wow. other guests. I got a chance to, to speak along with um Cheryl Johnson who is um who is over um people for community recovery and the daughter of Hazel Johnson the mother of the environmental justice movement and also mm -hmm. um pastor um Booker Vance he is uh, a community organizer for Elevate here in Chicago so I wish that segment um uh, could have been longer um because the heat itself deserves i think more than eight minutes but yeah for I, sure I, I, i'm glad uh, lynette can you tell people what elevate is elevate is an environmental um organization um they do work around like um utilities um i'm i'm this is my first interaction with them um due to the heat watch um but i'm i'm still trying to get to know like more about the work that they're doing 
Um, Because before the heat mapping project, I haven't, I wasn't familiar with Elevate and their work. And I think the the reality is is that we're going to see a lot of expressions. I mean, I'm I'm hearing people talk about global warming that couldn't have given a shit about it a week ago. Ah, uh, you see what I'm saying? And now, now come on now. Um, I'm gonna call on Howard next, and then comrades, I I apologize. I have uh, I'm double booked today, so I'll be on the phone. But in the meantime, Rand will be hosting, and Lou will be calling the stack. Um, go ahead, Howard. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I apologize to everyone, especially my big sister, Dr. Barbara Norman, for being late. Um, I, I hope that uh, everyone here really speaks to this, what is public health, uh, particularly people like Veda, uh, Veda, uh, if I'm not pronouncing your name right, sorry, uh, who's a mom, CPS parent. So my granddaughter uh, basically started school along with 300,000 other students this week. Uh, including Jesus's children, uh, Vita's children. I don't know who else here is a parent, sorry. Uh, but we're all probably somehow related to Chicago Public Schools. There's about a million people related to Chicago Public Schools. If you add up all the people who go to school, all the workers, all their families, all the neighbors, directly related. So what happened in the Chicago Public Schools that's related to uh, Dr. Norman's, again, brilliant talk? Uh, we had a situation where unfortunately our mayor who we all supported i'm assuming here uh is getting the wrong advice from the wrong people and doing the wrong thing yes uh, so basically uh there was a statement with his name on it that was issued uh on tuesday that most people here got a copy of if you did not please uh, email uh, lynette uh, and myself at prncoalition uh, at gmail.com we'll put that in the chat that basically said the city was going to do two things two things. It was going to take six cooling centers for 2.8 million people. Uh, that's about 450,000 people per cooling center um, mm -hmm. and extend the hours from 5 to 7 p.m. When everyone in the Department of Health knows, and so do lots of other people, that when people get really sick and die is at night uh, from heat waves. And the reason for that are heat islands uh, which Lynette and other people will explain, but it's real simple. Th these are big areas like the Dan Ryan Expressway, like the seven freight yards that Chicago has, more than any city um, in the United States, um, and warehouses like the biggest one uh, that's ever been built less than a mile from where I'm speaking in Little Village, Hillco, et cetera, et cetera. These big heat islands have been built and are being built faster and faster, while because of racist redlining, uh, there is basically very few trees and parks in neighborhoods like this. So people um, cannot cool off. Um, you don't have to go to medical school to know that the main way that we cool off is to have our perspiration evaporate. Mm -hmm. That's how it's been for about three million years since we first stood on two feet, um, probably in Tanzania. So basically, that's what the city did. That's not public health. That's genocide. Okay, public health would be, uh, as Dr. Norman and I did, and lots of the people we worked with uh, under Mayor Washington, would be, first of all, to mobilize all city workers who are not police to go to those neighborhoods that we already know for 100 years are the ones at highest risk on the south, southwest, and west sides. They would go door to door. It's not call 311, which doesn't work 95% of the time. It's not use your app which the people who are at highest risk don't even have an app or a cell phone to use it. Right. Um, to go door to door and a knock on people's door with an ID from the Chicago Department of Public Health, Human Services, CPS, you name it, and find out if people have air conditioning and do they need to get the air conditioning. Uh, so that's number one. That's done by the city and with community grassroots community-based organizations. Number two is to open up um, every school with air conditioning every library, every park park field house, et cetera, et cetera, to be cooling centers 24 seven, at least on uh, Wednesday and Thursday into Friday morning. Number three is what the city did several times, including in 2006, when there was a big blackout on the South side uh, during a heat wave and send all kinds of CTA buses, particularly at night to be close to people and get people on the bus who could not get any other place. That's a response. I'll just say one other thing to show what public health is. 
And that's what happened on June 28th, 2023, two months ago. The President of the United States was flying into Chicago uh, to meet with Governor Pritzker and Mayor Brandon Johnson. He couldn't see the ground until he almost tripped, as he always does when he got off the plane, uh, because it was the worst air quality due to smoke from wildfires. It went mm -hmm. over 300. Uh, we never right. went over 200 before uh, the air quality index. And what did he do? He should have offered the mayor and the governor uh, millions of N95 masks, which he has in storage and could mobilize in minutes. He didn't do that. The governor and the mayor should have done it, but they didn't do it. Okay. They basically didn't do anything except tell people to stay inside. Well, tell my postman to stay inside. Tell the UPS drivers to stay inside. Tell everybody else who works outside to stay inside and then pay their wages for the day. Um, so those masks should have been distributed. Uh, these centers should have been opened up again, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So those are just two examples. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that as everybody here related to CPS knows, we have massive under vaccination of children everywhere in this yeah. country. We are going to have measles outbreaks. We are going to have whooping cough outbreaks. You may not hear about them in the news uh, this fall, uh, as well as flu and, and COVID, which is surging all over. Uh, what we have to do is work together, and I hope that your organization can be part of this, to make a presentation this fall with all of us there in person who can be there to the Chicago Board of Education saying they have an opportunity with the mayor of the of Chicago to do something no other school district has ever done in history. And that has become a vaccine for children provider under the umbrella of the Chicago Department of Public Health so that every nurse can offer every vaccine to every child in their school. Thank you very much. Good. Power, that was super amazingly clear as ever. And I think one of the things that PRN does beautifully is, um, the ordinances but the the work and we're more like we're just starting out so hard we're 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 a network right we're in, we're in like affiliation um but i do believe that healthcare is gonna be key whether whatever right um i think one of the things that really upset me oh you have no idea did you i don't know if you read the article in the chicago, chicago tribune i believe it was talking about all the schools that were like uh struggling to to turn on air conditioning I'm like, what the flip, man? What kind of system do we? <laughs> oh, it was horrible, right? Um, and I, I, I think people need to tell stories about what, what you know what I mean. Uh, I know my husband was also saying, well, the private schools are also experiencing hardship, but I, I don't feel it's bad for the private schools because they got more money. You know, I mean, they're stealing voucher money from public schools. So, and I, yeah, I feel for the students, but come on now, you know. Um, okay, somebody else. Somebody else who wants to pick up the thread, I, I or, or uh, but I think quick, we're prepared to, I, to work I with y'all. So, so I just want to say one other quick thing, and and hope that Barbara and and Lynette will also speak to this. We need everybody on board now to unite to get the best health commissioner possible. Uh, the the mayor has appointed a transition team. We can't say who that is, but it's not good. There's only one person on there who represents a community like this. So we right. hope that we will all work together over the next couple of weeks to get the best commissioner possible. And someone, look, because one of the things that also upset me with our Wadi is that who they appointed to manage the pandemic had no healthcare experience at all. Weren't they like fucking trained administrators or some uh. shit? Sorry, sorry, sorry. They weren't even qualified. They were not. I'm like, what? Who are it's just so damn frustrating to be living under these dictatorship corporate people. This is a human trash that don't care about the people, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, right now on the health committee, it's pretty much all of Dr. Allison Arwadi, friends and allies on the CPD PH search committee. There is uh, no one on that committee um, who is public health um, interested. They're focused on the medical model. As Dr. Norman stated, that's different from the public health model. And um, Dr. Norman definitely deserves to be on that um, public health committee. Uh, I'm disappointed that, you know, Mayor Brandon Johnson didn't reach out to Dr. Norman, um, especially because the... Uh, Mayor here of Washington Legacy Committee endorsed um, Brandon mm -hmm. for mayor. Um, 
So I think it's a huge mistake on um it's a huge mistake on on um improving the quality of lives of um all Chicagoans um for for Mayor Johnson not to have Dr. Norman on that um CDPH um committee search committee. Or, or Howard, I mean, I'm sorry, not to say even, H Howard and Barbara are both, you know, they don't just carry institutional memory, man. They walk the walk. You know what I mean? And, and that's mm -hmm. the thing that's frustrating. And anyway, yeah. Um, they, However, I don't want to throw shade on United Working Families, but, and I'm not, because I'm on the legislative committee, just heads up. They, they, they were very proud of the fact that Awadi was fired. Okay, that's beautiful. But now let's get people on that damn committee. Let's get, like, you know, Howard says, people that are going to meet our, fuck oh, sorry, our basic needs, uh, right? I can do it, Barbara. I can do it. How, how, how? <laughs> I, and, and, you know, that that's what I think we got to really support each other to put those pressure points um, to, to be able to, 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 damn it, we, we deserve public health. Our kids deserve to be safe, you know? Come on now. Um, let's hear from somebody else. Joy, how about you? You want to speak to your efforts? Oh, um, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, appreciate what everyone's been saying. Barbara's been great as usual. Yay, Barbara. Thanks so much. <laughs> for such an important uh, presentation because so many people don't know much about uh, public health. We don't have a good understanding. Uh, yes, thank you, Michelle. We do. We love us and Barbara. Uh, I've, been, I've been still I'm still keeping track of what's going on with COVID, COVID and I've been surprised that CBS News actually published a couple of articles, one saying that the CDC, of all people, are saying that COVID hospitalizations are going up, which I was like, finally, and they also acknowledged that teen, COVID teen hospitalizations are going up. I think they're going up like in, in Kentucky or something. So that those are two huge things that the CDC has said. So I, I, was, <laughs> I was like in shock. I was like, am I reading this right? The CDC actually gave a couple of important information, to, you know, to people. So I think that's a that's a great thing. Um, as far as the clean air for um, healthy, equitable schools bill that it passed the ha the state house, and we weren't able to to pass it in the Senate before the deadline, but we're working to pass it during the <clears throat> during the veto session, which is in October, November. We're planning a, um, a subject matter hearing either late September, early October. And we've, we were, we've been looking into the, um, the funding and it turns out over half of the money that's been set aside, and what's it called, ESSA, ESSA, something funding it still hasn't been spent so i think the deadline is to apply is like next year september 2024 and so i don't i'm hoping we can beat the deadline otherwise there there are um some grants that that can be looked at and i'm so happy that the ctu is already on board with it that they endorsed it as well as the illinois federation of teachers and the seiu healthcare illinois and um i think a couple of smart local unions, Illinois, unions in Illinois. So that's labor on board, <laughs> that's, which is a big thing. So we're chugging along and um, wastewater is going up. And on the latest just dashboard, it's like everything's in the red just about, except for death. Death has stayed the same since last week, but hospitalization is going up. The hospital beds in use is going up. The ER is going up. Not significantly, but it's going up. And vaccinations are actually going up. Testing is going up, even though they're not free. Testing is going up. And so for some reason, Asians have the highest positivity. I think it's like 21% among Asians. Uh, I think um, even though it looks like Blacks are testing the most, even though it's still super low, the rate is, is especially starting June, it went, it's almost seemed not non existent. But uh, every day it says like 500 something black people are testing, but the, the positivity rate is low. So I don't know how many of them are um, swabbing both throat and nose or what's going on there. Uh, but 
yeah, that's that's what's happening with COVID. It needs to be. I hope that this new um, commissioner can do a much better job in getting the word out. And I just uh, responded to the Florida Surgeon General, who's saying that masking doesn't work. <laughs> and oh my God! What? <laughs> Yeah, he's a, so I, I I I actually responded and and some people are started liking it about how SIDRAP Center for Infectious Diseases Research and Policy had, had even said, look, this cloth and surgical masks aren't going to work, but you need the respiratory, the N95. So, so many of these idiots, including a sur state surgeon general, are saying that you know the masks don't work, and it's like, of course they do, because I remember even Arwady was. In her in her exit interview, I'll call it with Marianne Marianne Ahern, it claimed that, well, yeah, we found there were some harmful effects to masking or whatever. It's like, really? <laughs> just like, good. I'm glad, glad she's gone. <laughs> that she actually said that mess out of her mouth. In the CDC hip pack meeting, uh, they didn't vote yet. They're going to vote in November, but they were they're recommending surgical masks in healthcare settings. And so, you know, National Nurses United and a lot of other organizations got together. People, CDC, were like, hell to the naw. And I got to record a, um, a comment to be submitted because a lot of people who didn't get to speak during the meeting are getting, got to submit one. So I, I went with the um, World Health Network and they had people sign into a, a Zoom and speak for three minutes and, and they're going to submit those and, and make those public. So there you go. And you know what? I, I was uh, I was I went to part of that meeting, and one one of the things, and I get that they're all doctors, but there was so much ass padding happening. It, it was boring, dude. Like, why don't they make those meetings accessible to the public? You know? And that's another thing. Like, you know, like have this kind of conversation where we can actually talk as people and and not talking heads. You know, so I didn't last long. I tried. I think I lasted for like thirty minutes, and I was out. Plus, they recorded it, so you can see the recording and see what I'm talking about later. But um, that that is, you know, to me, people like Arwadi or like this, uh, the, the general, whatever the shit is called, um, you know, doctor at Florida, should go to jail because they what they're doing is essentially telling people, okay, don't don't do these things that are gonna save your lives. Go ahead, go ahead and die. You know, go ahead and get infected with COVID or some super virus mm -hmm. and die. And that to me, that come on now, we we gotta call it what it is, you know. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Lauren says the only the only harm I can imagine to masking is having bad breath. Yo, and on the reels I teach for a living, there are times when I would put the mask on when my breath was funky, and that's okay too. You know, whatever. <laughs> All right. Uh, somebody else wants to. Uh, Ran, we're stopping at twelve thirty, even though Barbara and Howard both left. Because, like we said, we we all experts. And Michelle, let's hear from you, sister. Um. Is it is it Dr. Bautista on or is it his lovely wife on? Not that the lovely husband isn't also lovely. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's not Dr. Bautista. I'm uh, Michelle Bautista. I'm here with my kids. I'm just here to get some touch points on what to do. You guys are always helpful in keeping me in touch. So I got my little list of who to call and what to ask. Um, I'm a mom of two CPS kids and I like to stay active. I also believe that public health needs to be for the public. So I'm just happy to be here and thank you so much. <laughs> oh, well, it's wonderful to have you, Michelle, and uh, give my regards to the husband, Daryl. Yeah, a hundred percent. And we were talking about earlier in the meeting, how a lot of us as parents were livid. I mean, okay, it was me that they made our kids go back to school without being vaccinated. That again, too, I thought was criminal. Like why risk our kids? And right now, um, there, there, correct me if I'm wrong, Joey, but there is an increase in hospitalizations of young people with COVID, you know, because yeah. I think what we're going to see is like, because we're not socially distancing or masking, that we're going to see spikes. Like, I know I teach at Harold Washington, and I started teaching on Thursday, and right away I got an email from a student with COVID, you know, and so, you know, that, that we, we got to really, there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, somebody else, a Lou or somebody else who we haven't heard from, I know we got some, some friends uh uh other parts of the country maybe if you want to speak to what's happening in your neck of the woods yeah us too two cps kids for sure anybody else yeah i ran here go ahead hit it brother yes my big concern since i'm in a rural area kitty clear from uh, chicago near benton harbor here is that the emphasis 
on a national level that our children are at the nexus of public health, right from the get go that they're born through to the school systems. And we have to make sure that the teachers, those that are in most contact with the general larger broad uh, view of the health of our children be trained properly to recognize health problems. And my personal story is I have 11 grandchildren and parents are really great. I'm proud of my children and raising them. But in one household, they have five to eight, depending upon who's around. Um, and it was only when they got into mid elementary did they recognize that one of my grandchildren was blinded one eye. Now they took their children to the general, uh, you know, practitioner regularly, but they didn't screen the children properly health wise. It was only then that the teacher, great teacher, uh, recognized that, you know, my grandson was blind in one eye. And then same regards in the nearly the same age at third grade, we discovered that one of my older grandchildren at the time was deaf in one ear. And it was only because the teacher was there, the parents, you know, having their hands full with five to you know eight kids, family, children as well, um, we're attentive, but it was here again, the same damn teacher that recognized that Atari, my grandson, was deaf in one ear. So on a national level, this nexus of where they're in school, additionally, and we all know that you have kids in school, you're going to be exposed to everything that's going around in school. And of course, inner school sports, all my children are you know wrestlers, uh, they spread disease rapidly. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. That's brilliant. And I think you're right. Um, Lauren, you've elevated a couple of comments in the chat. I don't know if you want to speak on un mic and speak. On mic? Yeah, unmute. I've, I've been trying to work on my own, like, you know, routine for routine for this about masking. Like I said, I think I would just say it. I also realize, yeah, now I like to, I, I prefer to wear a mask on the public transportation not just for uh you know the um you know the health the health reasons but i don't know if anybody noticed it's 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 kind of funky sometimes when you get on the when you get on the l train so i i'm still i'm still masking up you know i don't know about the rest of you guys i'm still masking up on public transportation especially i would too man i would even go a step further and wear gloves you know michelle said death is super funky no, but no. Seri seriously, they, they. I also saw a statistic that you know regular flu. I, I think it was like they were you know tracking it like the first like after the first year or so of the pandemic. You know the regular flu also went down. You know during during uh, you know all of these like restrictions. So I don't know how anybody could come up with something saying you know masking doesn't work. I mean all of the you know, all the all all the evidence points that it does, you know. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's just ideological and it's political and again, it's killing people. I'm sorry. Um let's see, uh 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 Veda, I hope I pronounced her name, Veda Francois says, Yeah, the surge in COVID was acknowledged, but it's minimized at the same time by stating the risk is low. They're still not being completely transparent. What's going to take it serious and tell the public there's a low risk? From my understanding, the new variant of concern doesn't even register with current tests, and not everyone is testing, so it's safe to triple those reported numbers. Families should be given more options when there's a surge. And, you know, i got to say that something that's disturbed me, and I try, I look, I don't want to be that our activist that tells people what to do, but when it comes to public health, I think we have a special responsibility that I've run into parents now that I'm like, oh, I'm not vaccinating my kids no more. One, one, one vaccine was enough. What the flip? Where are they getting this information that just because you got vaccines last year, you're still good. And and I had to tell, I had to explain to this person, I'm like, well, you know, the virus mutates, right? And I tell her straight up, I'm vaccinating all my family, not myself personally, but flu vaccine, COVID vaccines. And and um, because that that to me is not just putting her kids are at risk, really, you know, why would you do that? Um, Grownups too, and I'm talking like scientists. These are people with degrees. That are like, oh, I'm not getting vaccinated no more. What the hell is going on? These are educated people that are like, no, no more vaccines. I'm like, stupid, dude. But um, Howard's got right. his hand up. Who? Howard. 
Howard, hit it, Howard. Uh, just want to thank Rand uh, for what he said about schools, and it would be great to hear from all the parents or grandparents here about this issue. Uh, also, you got a great beard, Rand. So um, I think what happened is we, in the last 40 years, uh, we made a step forward by establishing school health centers. There's a several thousand of those. However, most schools do not have a health center. Uh, most school districts do not have a nurse full-time, although one of the victories of the Chicago Teachers Union is that by next year, every school in Chicago is supposed to have a full-time nurse. That's a great victory. And that's a, a thing upon which to rebuild what Rand's talking about. We used to send Department of Health and school personnel into every school for dental checks, hearing checks, eye checks, vaccines, you name it. That's got to be reestablished. And that's why we hope that everybody here can work together to start with a vaccine for children program. Uh, this fall, we're going to make a presentation to the Chicago Board of Education, probably in October or November. But we need to have lots of people and lots of organizations to even have a chance of that happening uh, and push for everything else to come back and better. I like that. Come back and better. Because it's not enough to go back to where we were, although hearing it from y'all sounds like freaking utopia, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. You're welcome here anytime. We're going to have a meeting in a couple of weeks again, um, but planning to have more of these discussions because I think they're really important. And if you haven't seen, because some of y'all came in a little bit late, no, no, no shade, but there's going to be a big treatment on trauma meeting on Sunday. Uh, Joy, if you wouldn't mind posting that again, I believe registration is still open. They're doing a treatment on trauma, bring Chicago home combo to see to see what's up with that. Good to see you, sister. See, see you there. Um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful discussion, Howard. Thank you for your uh, elevation of issues and whatnot. Uh, somebody else who we haven't heard from. Okay, Lauren, Bridget, had a, Lauren had a did, point in, tra in chat. Elevator for me, brother. Um, it was. No, very, no, very simply, it's just that this idea that I think one of the things that didn't help this whole idea of public perception was just how ruthlessly and shamelessly the big pharma companies profiteered off of all of this, you know? And so, you know, that was the thing I was going to put in the chat too. I would like to see some component of, you know, grassroots work toward public acceptance, you know, maybe come up with some component or something that, you know, would get these farm comp pharma companies accountable for what, what they did. And just how, like I say, ruthlessly, they, you know, the, the, one of the guys that was the founder of Moderna is worth $4 billion as a result of this you know what i mean so i I, th I think that that that's that's part of an issue too and i can understand why especially in my community there were a lot of people that were just very suspicious about you know how they were you know trying to push these vaccines on everyone right yeah, i mean still, you, still, I, we still, know how still. we we know how we stand on all this i'm just saying big pharma needs to be held accountable well, there's a hand up. absolutely uh four billion bridges says who's got her hand up brother Lynette. Lynette. Yeah, ahead, Lynette. Thanks. I just I just wanted to say like um vaccines are still like a polarizing, you know, political issue. If you look at um our um FK, you know, running as a Democrat anti vax. Um so so you know, these vaccines are politicized in a different branch of parent rights advocacy. As we saw, like even before the pandemic, Jenny McCarthy, you know, pushing the anti-vaccine and, you know, she made these lies saying that the vaccine was, list, was linked to autism and she was like the spearhead, like progenitor of the anti-vax movement that we see going on now. And I also see that as like, you know, the evolution of Trump and um in Trumpian light politics. Um that's all I want to say for now. So my husband has been attentively listening because we're in the car. I'm sorry, I gotta walk. Um and he, he want he was it's actually really a question for Lauren, but I, I kinda like he wants to know if the perception of vaccination has changed, especially in communities of color. Um, 
that that was a question. He, like from there one to of now. The little known, put it this way, one of the little known facts is that college educated African Americans are actually the highest vaccinated demographic in the college country. People don't know that. So the answer to your the short answer to your question is yes. Anybody want to elevate their comments from the chat or um, we got about 15 minutes yet? Veda has a has a uh, point to make in the in the chat. You want to speak it? You want me to to read it? Why don't you go ahead and elevate it? I'll, I'll read it. Has... Yeah, it's, it says uh, uh, <clears throat> Veda says a lot of people aren't getting the COVID vaccines in particular because they've had adverse reactions. However, it would be great to stress and make sure all protective measures are ensured when relating to public health. I agree, big pharma should be held accountable. I wanna say myself, I just wanna say one quick thing, and that is we, when we talk about public health, the word public is really very important. Um, it emphasizes, or it, it should be recognized that it emphasizes how privatized our healthcare system is, even including Social Security, uh, Medicare, I mean. It's very, very heavily privatized. And, and the point that Lauren made in terms of the, uh, the big pharma making all kinds of money it's not just on vaccines, it's everywhere in the system. And uh, what we're really talking about seems to me is a, is a system which ends, ultimately ends this private stranglehold on, on healthcare. Thank you. And, and one of the things too that, um, I'm sorry, it's noisy. Um, that we also talked about is how not just big pharma, but the insurance companies really, I don't even know what the hell insurance is for, man. You know, they hardly cover anything, but they, they were also very profit driven in this whole endeavor. And I, I don't right. know that it should about keeping the. I see you're freezing. I'm sorry, it's a Wi-Fi. Just go on without me. <laughs> sorry. I think the point Hensu was making in terms of uh, of uh, insurance is really, really important. Um, Lauren, go ahead. I just wanted to, I just wanted to you know publicly give a shout out to Lynette who uh, was with uh, Cheryl Johnson and another uh, gentleman, I think Steve Bant, or it was his name, who um, they were on uh, WTTW last night on Chicago Black Voices, you know, talking about the effects of the heat on different communities in Chicago. And once again, it just pointed out this idea of public health. I don't know, is Lynette, Lynette, are you still on? Yes, and thank you for the shout out. I'm quick, still on. Quick, quick. Wish, yeah, quick. Can I you quick sure give us a synopsis of what you guys talked about for the ones that didn't see it? Yeah, so um, we talked about how the Black community dealt with the um, last heat wave. Uh, we spoke about isolation and what, especially the elder population, we, we spoke about um, the city's response um, giving out water bottles, um, and also like the work that we've, we've done in the past with the city. Um, that's, that was mainly Cheryl's, um, point, how the city, you know, needs to work in better partnership with CBOs, community-based organizations around, um, getting the word out about satellite cooling centers that's nearby, that people had no idea that they could um, 
Well, one of, one of the points I think that you made that really, like I say, once again, illustrated the whole public health uh, aspect of it is this idea that, you know, what you what we've seen in our community, there's been, you know, like last 20 years, you could say, uh, decrease in the population here, right? And, yeah. and, and, and because of that, you know, this kind of heightens this idea of, you know, the isolation, which is a key, has been shown as a key element to wellness especially for seniors, right? So once again, I thought that that point really just brought out this idea that, you know, public health is not just about, you know, medicine. And I guess what people are, you know, referring to here, you know, in this session is this idea that we don't have a concept of public health because you can't, you know, market it. What people here are encouraged to do is think of health as just another consumer product that you consume individually, which, you know, means, you know, every man for themselves. And it's not something that you could say, you know, we as a, as the public or as a, you know, as a community have to, you know, think about. So, like I said, I thought that that was really excellent what you what you guys did on Channel 11 last night. Thanks for sharing it with yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. I wish I could have said more about, you know, how the, the decrease of Black population has, you know, affected this aspect because we have less caregivers. You know, younger younger generation moved from Chicago due to economic reasons, also public safety you know, issues, not feeling comfortable um, due to the, you know, gun violence and gun violence is a public health issue. Um, so much more could have been said, but I'm grateful for the opportunity. And I'm glad that you all are, you know, like those of you who already saw it, the segment, because I didn't go on there as a representative as Latinet. I went on there as People's Response Network. So I'm glad that y'all liked it. Missy, you got your hand up, and uh, hey, after you, Howard, I apologize. How, and then Howard. Thank you, love. I apologize. So, you know, I, I just recently reactivated Radical Books and Activists. I would love to have you all on again to talk about this issue of, and because one of the things I want to do at Harold Washington, and Howard, I hope you'll be a part of this in the PRN and other groups, is to have, uh, I haven't, I'm still working on the title, like Global Warming and Racism and the Ties to Capitalism, something like that. But this whole question about environmental racism in the black community or lack of health, uh, you know, resources and, and the black and brown communities, not just, you know, and, and poor whites, too. Right. That I think this is something that we need to talk more about. So the show runs for, for 30 to 45 minutes. If you all want to come on and I'm doing it on Sundays, um, I can shoot to the calendar via signal, which, by the way, I do encourage you all to join the signal. It's just a way that a lot of uh, people in the south, mostly the south and west side are keeping in touch and keeping each other informed about events that are coming up. Um, so so I encourage you to do that as well. It's open to everybody. And we do have these meetings uh, every other week. We have not this uh, Saturday, but the next Saturday at 11 o'clock that we're going to do these and hoping to do these uh, talks at least once a month. So I just wanted to give a pitch on that. And this is my son saying, hello, comrade. Say hi to everybody. Hi. Go ahead, Howard. Yeah, I just want to lift up like everybody else, uh, Lynette's great uh, presentation last night. Um, I think it's uh, too bad the, the moderator didn't give her more time to speak, but that'll happen next time. Uh, I, I want to focus on one issue, and that is housing as a public health crisis. Uh, you know, at the end of the 19th century, uh, Ida B. Wells got married uh, and moved from Memphis to Chicago uh, for a lot of reasons, but one was to lead the fight for housing. Um, for African Americans who were coming. Um, and what's happened since then in the last 130 years, uh, we've lost that fight everywhere. And we have to see that the question of taking back control of the people of CHA, of the board, of having an elected board of Chicago Housing Authority, which is just as important as an elected board of the Chicago Public Schools, is a huge issue related to what Lynette and everybody's been saying. We have to rebuild public housing in Chicago that's low rise quality public housing like exists in some places, right? It exists in Chicago. My aunts grew up in Lathrop Homes in the 1930s. Uh, Lathrop Homes was so good that the gentrifiers tried to take the whole thing over. Uh, and we won about, you know, half of those homes are still CHAs. So that's a really huge issue. We have to stop 
the selling of private land. We have this of public land for housing. We have to stop the new high school uh, that basically the South Loop uh, parents want built on CHA land and rebuild public housing now. Can also... I say something about that high school real quick? I apologize. That okay. high school is going to service a very small, that got less than a thousand students, and it's going to cost millions of dollars. What is up with that? When there are two perfectly good high schools there, but they want to build something, something for the bourgeoisie is what it amounts to. Why? It makes no sense. You know, uh, we've been trying to fight that at National Teachers Academy, but uh, um, you know, uh, what what ended up happening though is instead of fighting for just taking taking the taking it back, what they did is that they're just trying to argue for a few seats because they lie to the community, especially the Chinese community, and say, oh. This is going to be a public school for you when it's really a selective enrollment school, and they're not going to be letting black and brown and Asian kids into that school just because they live near there. And that's the thing that's just criminal to me, you know. Um, it's a lot of shitty shit that happens in CPS. So, bogus Chicago, cool, cool, cool. Um, Tim, you got your hand raised, brother? I, I heard. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, in regards to um, the issue uh, with with public health uh, as well, the the in the recent uh, uh, with the mig migrant crisis, um, they, they there was a, a concerted effort to to uh, split the uh, brown and black communities, uh, and and one I think was probably the reason why that with with uh, a lot of the migrants coming in, if an issue came up, it was an international issue, and if it was an issue that was a domestic, you know, then it was something they were able to manage, you know what I mean? So it seems that there has been a, um, a, a concerted effort to, to separate, to, to put, put those two groups together, which is a shame because those are all resources that, that we, we have for them, but we are not sharing them it just uh, equitably. Um, that, that's one thing. And then uh, two, in regards to uh, the health care um, with, with COVID, uh, coming back, uh, starting to the numbers starting to go up. The the tests are not free, and who who's who's able to pay ten dollars for a box of three tests? You know, and people are going to say they're you're asking them, are they going to pay you know rents or, or COVID tests or you know you're so those numbers of being able to do self tests are you know are expensive, and they're not there isn't um, a bunch of um, Free tests, or free uh, locations anymore. So I think that we're um, we're we're kind of seeing a um, separation for both those. So uh, I just wanted to mention. That. Thank you. Can I just say one more thing? I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot. In terms of the asylum seekers during this massive heat wave, what did they do? Did they provide cooling centers for the und und undocumented and asylum seekers? No. They just made him stand outside of the effing police department and set up, come on now, what is that? That to me was disgusting and criminal. And, you know, Tim and I were talking about this because we just wrote a really beautiful article. I mean, I, I piled on top of his beautifully written article about the toddler who died on the way here, which is horrible and terrible. But, you know, there is enough abundance to me, not just the needs of asylum seekers, but of the poor, these communities that we're talking about. And, and, and yet they make these choices that are dehumanizing. I mean, shit, Ireland, freaking Ireland, which is not the richest country in the world, is providing hotel rooms for asylum seekers, free food, free health care. If Ireland can do it, why the hell can we do it here too? Come on now. You know, it's disgusting. We yeah. also just have three minutes left. I think we should close out. Um, who's going to take us home? It looks like Ran is wants to uh, say something to bring us home. Go ahead, Ran. Yes, um, I'd like to make two public health announcements. One, water. We're all in the Great Lakes region, and uh, Freshwater.org, based in Pekoski, Michigan, but includes members throughout our region. Great Lakes region is having an October fourth. Uh, Zoom event, as well as a national or regional conference in Benton Harbor, Michigan. 
registration is a deadline is August 31st, and I'll put the link to that in the chat. Additionally, I'd like to promote the Public Health Pulse podcast that's hosted by Rita, and I'll put that link to the podcast as well. Uh, it's sponsored by the People's CDC, and this podcast originates largely in the South, but all the same issues that we have everywhere, including uh, guests from San Joaquin's Valley. And I would just like people to have an opportunity to see this as well. So I'll put the link there as well as place them in the signal. And I'll push this as a button pusher or technoid. Signal is the place to go. Join up if you want to keep a tabs on what's happening. You know, this is an issue of basic needs and taking back Chicago for our own use, for our own needs. And that's it. One, one hey, other point, bro, Rand. I, I couldn't what? close it out any better than that. That was brilliant. He said, um, you're all welcome to come back here anytime. Meet every every couple of weeks at 11 to 12. Keep the meetings to an hour. But these discussions are clearly going to go longer. But let's keep working on this healthcare issues. I do think this is going to be one of our primary foci as well as the environment. Because to me, those issues are interrelated. But Lou, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, brother. I just wanted to say that Howard had something in the, in the chat also. Uh, I know he said it earlier, but I just wanted to lift it up at the end. Uh, we hope everyone can join PRN and, and several sister organizations for the national film showing and discussion of Cooked Survival by Zip Code, the real story of the 1995 Chicago heat wave, the worst in U.S. history when 739 people died. Blacks died two times more than whites proportionately. So yeah, that... I, just want, I just want to say thank you, Lou, for that. And just real quickly, it's not just about showing the film. It's about building networks uh, locally, regionally, and nationally, which we call uh, networks to thrive and survive. I love that. Somebody remind me to write that down, because I think we have an opportunity to connect with the people doing the, the Great Lakes environmental work. But us, I think we're grappling to figure out how are we going to come together how are we going to gain the political power that we need to get our basic needs met, right? So listen, I just want to thank everybody. I thought this was a beautiful first discussion. Howard, thank you. Lynette, thank you. Everybody who joined up. Um, the next one we're going to do is going to be on the environment, but we also have fun having two. They're going to be high flex events. So we're just going to be a Zoom component and then a panel component. But Howard, let's stay in touch because or any of you, look, any of us could be on this panel, right? Um, thank you, everybody. Much love and appreciation to y'all. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for doing tech. And thank you, Lou, for helping out with the um, the chingalera, whatever. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm also really tired. Y'all have a good day. Much love and peace to all of you. Bye-bye. Adios.